Uh, good morning, everyone. It is, uh, believe it or not, still morning here in Maryland. It's been a long morning. Um, my topic today lies somewhere between the obvious and the heretical. Uh, so for some of you, it may be very obviously true, and so why am I saying it? And for others, it may be very obviously not true, and so again, why am I saying it? Um, so I'd ask you to bear with me a little bit here. But uh, what I'm going to be claiming is that literate people have a native script. And uh, what that means is that they have an S1, uh, which is related to any later script that they learn, an S2, in a way that is similar to the way our native language, or L1, uh, relates to our L2. And there are uh, synchronic and diachronic consequences of this relationship between S1 and S2. And I call these the native script effect. And um, part of what uh, is implied by this is that a knowledge of our script is similar to knowledge of a language. Or in other words, scripts have grammar too. And uh, what is implied by that in turn is that writing is more like language than we or we linguists, I'm a linguist, were taught to believe. And um, something that comes out of it, out of this that I believe is that writing actually becomes language. In other words, the answer to the question of re whether writing is or is not language isn't really yes or no, but rather than that writing uh, becomes language. And that happens both phylogenetically in the development of writing culturally and ontogenetically in the lifetime of an individual. So just quickly before I um, get too far underway here. What do I mean by script? I'm using Weingarten's definition where a script is a somewhat abstract set of graphic signs with prototypical forms and prototypical linguistic functions. In other words, it's more than just the simple set of signs, but it's also less than the full combination of signs with all the orthographic rules in a given language that get you the full writing system of the language. And under this definition, you can have languages that share a script, even if they don't share a writing system. And so if you learn a second language, that may or may not share your first language's script, your S1. And I note, though, that even language is a somewhat abstract term here, so that what we actually speak when we speak our native language is a dialect. And so um, we can consider uh, script is super superordinate uh, term of writing system in the way that language is a superordinate term for dialect. Now, um, getting back to the heretical part, um, what every structuralist or generative linguist uh, knows about writing, like myself, I was trained in generative linguistics in the late um, 20th century, uh, and that is that writing is not language. Uh, but merely a way of recording language by vis visible marks, as Bloomfield very famously said. Or uh, more colorfully, Fred Householder said that among the propositions intuitively felt to be basic by friend and enemy alike among Bloomfielding linguists is that language is basically speech and writing is of no theoretical interest. And the result of this is that when um, people such as myself attempt to give talks, uh, about writing to linguistic audiences, you get comments like, this is not interesting, which I did get, uh, or this paper does not deal with linguistic matters, as James Myers has shared. Now, indeed, there is a real difference um, between writing and language. There's a real point here. And if you look at any introductory uh, textbook in linguistics, and you um, look at the chapter on writing, if there even is one, you'll get something like this. Language is as old as humankind, while writing is comparatively recent. Language reflects biological and cognitive modification of our species, but writing is merely a cultural development. Language comes naturally, writing does not. Language is acquired without specific formal instruction but writing must be taught and learned through deliberate effort. So um, by this view, language is not writing and uh, writing is not language because language is special. And as Chomsky has said over and over again, um, by this view, language 
marks the true distinction between humans and animals. And uh, this distinction is supposedly encoded in our brains uh, so that humans have what Chomsky has called a language acquisition device and the pinker is called a language instinct. And that is active during the so-called critical period when we're learning our L1. And so uh, because of that uh, influence of the critical language period, that when the language acquisition device is activated, uh, the native language or L1 is special. So L1 learning is fast, automatic, implicit, perfect, uh, but L2 learning is slow and difficult, usually imperfect, and uh, the speaker of an L2 is left with an accent. Also, there's positive and negative transfer from the L1 to the L2. So what I wanna ask here is how different is the relationship between L1 and L2 to the relationship between S1 and S2? And uh, in order to look at this, I wanna uh, retrace a little bit of personal journey that I took uh, because I love scripts. I like to learn scripts. I thought I was good at scripts. Um, but then I had to actually work in an S2, do uh, linguistic analysis in an S2. And uh, many of you have had this experience. But uh, what I found with this, this is the um, script of the Divehi or Maldivian language. It's called Pana. And what I found here is that it was very, very easy to learn it on an analytical level. There are 24 letters, they're right here, uh, 24 consonant letters, and there are 10 uh, vowel letters, 11 if you count the lack of vowel letter. Uh, so you can learn it in a day. I learned it in a day. And then it took years to become really comfortable with it. Here's the same text in romanization. And as you can see, uh, probably from the romanization and not the Devehi, uh, this text contains my name. And this is a great example because to be able to pick your own name out of text is something that we just take for granted. It, it will jump right out at you. But in uh, this case, it's right here, this does not jump out at me as being my own name. And similarly, when I was in the Maldives doing uh, field work, and I put a, a piece of paper with example sentences that I wanted to discuss in front of a consultant native speaker, uh, I was having trouble because it was upside down and I could not read the script upside down. And finally, the speaker said, look, why don't we just put the paper in front of you? Because I can read upside down because it was his native script. And meanwhile, as I was studying the Beijing, my daughter was studying Chinese and living in China. And she reported to me in considerable frustration that whenever she saw biscriptal uh, texts. So like this one here, where uh, there are characters and their romanization pinyin, um, that the eye of her eye as a S1 Roman user would be ineluctably drawn to the pinyin, even though the, um, the characters have much more information, they have morphological information that is not present in the pinyin. And often, uh, unlike the um, text that I'm showing you here, often um, pinyin will uh, be shown without the tone markings. So there's considerable reduction of information. So if you know the characters, there's more information in the characters. And yet the eye of a uh, Roman script S1 user will be ineluctably drawn to the pinyin. Here's another example. Um, and I, I I'm going to show you this, and if as you start to look at it, it might help to look at the letters that are against a black background first, and not the letters at top that are against a green background. But they say that if you can read this, you're not Japanese. And what they mean is, if you can read this, Japanese kana is not your S1. Um, so your S1 inter uh, highly influences how you interpret written shapes. 
Uh, after a while, you start seeing the um, native script everywhere. So uh, here's, here's a diff completely different um, example now taken from the, the field of pedagogy. The American Foreign Service Institute has five levels of difficulty for learning an L2, assuming that you're um, English L1. And so here, um, the first two levels uh, that take between uh, 24 and 36 weeks, those languages, uh, none of those use a non-Roman script. Then when you get into the higher levels that take a longer amount of time uh, to learn to a similar level of competency for similar um, uses, by the way, uh, you get at level three, the majority of them have a non-Roman script and at level four, all of them have a non-Roman script. Now, yes, there are um, confounding effects there in there with language relatedness, but um, surely this is not a coincidence. An example from history, uh, having to do with the Cherokee, Cherokee syllabary that was invented by Sequoia in the uh, early 19th century. Back in the 1820s when the syllabary was new, Cherokee children reportedly learned the syllabary in a few days and put it to use. And in fact, uh, the, the literacy rate among Cherokee at that time became uh, quite high, in fact, higher than among their white neighbors. But by contrast, in the 2000s, the syllabary is considered by many native speakers to be an extremely difficult writing system to learn and use. What changed? Well, what changed was uh, the S1. So um, in the 1820s, Cherokee, the Cherokee syllabary was the S1, and in the 2000s, the Roman alphabet was the S1. So the, um, the conclusion that you come to after a while is that an S2 is hard, um, and people don't like to do it. And in fact, the eye and the mind tend to slide off of text in, uh, that is written in S2. And this uh, has the effect of reducing, significantly reducing linguistic input in an L2 if that L2 is written in S2. Uh, and other people have observed a number of aspects of this effect, such as that it reduces the willingness to learn an L2 if it's in an S2. Uh, and that pedagogically speaking, S2 learners need targeted practice and that in fact, authentic texts, which are often really touted by language teachers may in fact be too hard. Uh, there are also issues then about uh, how much romanization to use and when to withdraw. There's also the fact that um, an S1 will produce an accent in the handwriting of S2. Machine learning can detect the handwriting of uh, S2 users. Uh, also, um, S1, uh, there's transfer from S1 to S2. So that, for example, um, readers, S1 readers of Korean will uh, process English, uh, Roman S2 uh, with different, different neural processing patterns than S1 readers of Chinese. Uh, but what, where I would like to uh, break some new ground here though, is to look at the historical consequences of the dominance of S1 over S2. Because I think uh, it can answer a, um, a fundamental question about the history of writing, which is, why are there so few different scripts? And by that, I don't mean, why are there so few written languages? There are many languages that are not written. But um, actually, of the written languages, there are many scripts, languages that share the same script despite very large differences in their morphologies and their phonologies that would make you think that um, the same script might not be appropriate to them. Uh, or to put it another way, why is innovation so rare in the history of writing? And in fact, a few blockbuster scripts dominate Chinese, Aramaic, Roman, Arabic, and Cyrillic, for example. And this is true both in modern times and uh, through history. So, Let's say um, you want uh, to write your language. You have a few options. You could completely invent a writing system from scratch as the Sumerians did, for example. Uh, this has only happened a few times in history. Uh, or 
you could at some level or another be inspired by the fact that other people write their languages. And um, so on the one hand, you could just borrow the general idea of writing, but go about it uh, in your own way. That's the diffusion model. Or you could just borrow someone else's script wholesale and apply it to your own language. And in practice, there's a real spectrum of adaption, adaptation uh, between these two um, options. But the point I want to make here is that adoption, or that end of the spectrum, is far more common than you'd think it should be, based on the properties of languages. So uh, languages that are of a completely different language family will end up um, adopting a, somebody else's script just wholesale. Um, or with minor um, changes. So some examples from history where um, scripts have crossed language families. For example, Chinese characters used for Vietnamese, Japanese, and Korean. Uh, and this is despite the fact that Japanese and Korean are morphologically synthetic and um, Chinese characters, uh, Chinese is not. The Aramaic alphabet spread from Syria to Manchuria. And by the time it got there, yes, it was rather different than it had started, but the changes at each step are relatively small. And again, uh, you're jumping from one uh, family to another, Semitic to Indo-European to Turkic to Mongolic to Tungus. So just to take one example of the, um, the, uh, this, these leaps that were taken when um, the alphabet was used for Sogdian. It was 22 letters, as Aramaic had originally been. Uh, and so when it crossed then um, from Indo-European so uh, Sogdian to Turkic Uyghur, uh, these 22 letters had to be used for 25 consonants and eight vowels of Uyghur, but no significant changes were made to the inventory. So the Cyrillic alphabet is used for Northwest Caucasian languages. The Cyrillic alphabet as used in Russian has 21 consonants. These languages have about 50 consonants apiece. The Roman alphabet is used for uh, many languages around the world, for example, for Bantu languages. Uh, I will not attempt to um, pronounce this language name, but uh, here's an example of a language that has 12 clicks and 43 other consonants. And uh, it's being written by the Roman alphabet, which has 21 consonant letters. Or again, uh, the Roman alphabet is now used for Vietnamese, and Vietnamese has 11 vowels, which have six tones. Uh, again, we don't have um, anywhere near, you would think, the ability to handle that. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip the next slide, but uh, the same sorts of things happen even within a script with um, major orthographic rules. So the mechanism by which this happens, I would propose, is that you've got um, an L1. person speaks a language at home. They learn that language at home. Now, if that language is not written and it is not um, a, a scholarly language, when that person goes to school, they will learn L2. And that language is written. And that language, um, that script will be written for that language. But now that script is S1, even though it's used for L2. So when L1 goes to be written, there is an S1 available, and that will tend to be used. Some other script that may be used by other communities or that you could make up, maybe somewhere out in the world somewhere, will tend not to be used because it is not the speaker's S1. And so the result of this is that powerful L2s, however they got that power, will have scripts that are actually even more powerful than they are. And the result then is that an established script spreads. And there are many reasons for this, but what I'd like to claim here is that it is at least in part a cognitive effect, uh, the native script effect. 
so getting uh, back to the heretical part of this, how could this be true? How could there be a native script if writing and language are so different? Isn't language special? Doesn't it use this special language acquisition device, this special grammar learning module in our heads? Um, and uh, yes, it is. But maybe that's the key. As Myers has said, once this flexible neural system evolved, it may have become as trigger happy as our face processing system, which detects faces anywhere, even in clouds, automatically switching on whenever it encounters any sufficiently complex communication challenge. So in other words, uh, yes, language is special, but language is special, so special that it will overpower and entrain other systems that uh, are significantly close enough uh, to match. And so uh, a consequence of this is that, yes, scripts display uh, grammatical properties both in their form and in their processing. So um, we come to, yes, language is special, but special may not mean exclusive. Special may mean in fact, overpowering such that uh, language, our language module in our head comes to uh, entrain our uh, writing skills. And so writing becomes language. And this happens both phylogenetically and ontogenetically. Phylogenetically, writing was not invented to record language. Uh, it came to record language and to more and more accurately represent language. But that was not, in fact, what it was invented for. Um, and ontogenetically, it may well be, as um, the writers of the introductory linguistics textbooks always point out to us, that children need teaching to learn to read. But they also apply their special language learning module, and they do learn some of the aspects of their writing system implicitly. So to conclude, S1 dominates S2 in ways that are similar to the way that L1 dominates L2. There is a native script effect. And there are synchronic consequences to this. And they play out in the individual. They play out in pedagogical decisions. They play out in policy decisions uh, when it comes to which script to adopt for language. There are diachronic consequences to this, especially uh, as I was pointing out in the spread of scripts. But it also comes uh, in to um, questions of script retention or reform. So that just as an example, when uh, King Sejong invented Hangul uh, in the 15th century, the literate people did not want to use it because they already had an S1. And there are theoretical consequences. It has uh, often been pointed out that uh, linguistic theory may be deeply influenced by the script of the linguists that are uh, propounding it. But if you think about the fact that a particular script is their S1, um, we may be uh, more motivated to look for ways in which linguistic theory may be influenced by that native script. And secondly, uh, how should our understanding of language, grammar, uh, and writing be adjusted. In other words, um, maybe the, the specialness of language is a slightly different than we thought. And again, then the answer to the question of whether writing is language may not be a simple yes or no. It may be that writing becomes language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amalia, for this very inspiring talk. Uh, before we turn to serious questions, I, I would like to give an example, a personal example of a conflict between S1 and S2. So if you don't mind, I will just interrupt. Please, yeah. Sharing, and then you can share again. I just wanted to show you an image. Uh, so. Here you are. What you see here 
is a French yogurt brand. So the brand is called Yoplait. And in Greek, there is an interjection, a very a cliche interjection, Opa. So they combined uh, the brand, Yo, which uh, also is the beginning of yogurt, with Opa, and they created this yogurt called Yopa. And they had this nice idea of writing it like this. So I don't know what you read, but I cannot avoid or reading Vora. So seeing Greek letters. Yes. My daughters uh, who have uh, been born and raised here in France uh, indeed read Yopa, as most French men uh, do. That is a great example. Um, in fact, I, one of these days I want to do a, a study of what I call script mimicry, in which the letters that are used look like letters of one script, but they're used to um, to say something in another script. And that is a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And uh, we have first a question by Kevin Donnelly. Hi, uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering what you'd think about this comment really, which is that you'd said that there was relatively little innovation in scripts and surely a major reason for that relates to conquest for example in the case of roman or arabic or cyrillic or cultural prestige for example in the case of chinese rather than reluctance to use a new script um you know you could have you have know, had examples of uh, l1 changing scripts like from vietnamese changing from chinese to roman central asian changing from aramaic based maybe to cyrillic or swahili from arabic to roman and so on and that isn't necessarily down to anything that the speakers themselves think about the, the, the script they're using. It's due to external situation. Um, what, what, what would be your views on that? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot of other reasons that go into it, but I feel like those reasons are have been um, have gotten the majority of the. Um, with the press, as it were, uh, and the, there is this the this other reason as well um, that people adults really hate to learn a new script, and that that would not have these sorts of consequences once you stop and think about it seems highly unlikely. So I think we've given more press time to these um, factors such as political prestige and so forth. Uh, and we've, we've um, neglected the idea that people just don't want to. <laughs> okay, thanks. And the next question by Ben Young. Uh, first off, thank you so much for the presentation. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. No. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. It's an absolutely fascinating topic. Um, so my question was, uh, do you, in, in the same way that it's possible to have multiple L1s, uh, do you believe it would also be possible to have multiple S1s? Um, oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And um, I guess a follow-up to that would be, um, uh, do you think that we might be seeing something like that with the Latin script? I was thinking about the fact that it, it seems like most young people these days are learning the Latin script alongside whatever their native script is, or, or whatever the, um, basically at the same time, I, I was noting that like, I've met, and I think I've met two people in the entire world who were literate, but could not read a Latin script. Like, and I've, and I've, and I travel pretty extensively. And so, yeah. and I was just wondering if, if, if we, if, Essentially, we may get to a point in which literally everyone's S1 is Latin script and in, in, in maybe they have a second one. Uh, I, I sort of sadly, I, I think you may be right. Um, well, I, mean, yes, I think it definitely is possible to have um, two S1s and, and even three. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Maldives, the children are taught three scripts from a very young age. They learn Tana, they learn Arabic, and they learn Roman. And I have watched um, videos of, it was actually of the former president of the Maldives giving a lecture to a class and he was writing notes on the board. 
and uh, he was writing in Devehi, and then he used the word for economy, and that's a long word for from Arabic, and he just slipped right into Arabic, and then some other words in English, and he was like doing all of this in three scripts, and just the ability to juggle those scripts is just very impressive, and you get that, um, code switching, similar to uh, the way bilingual speakers will code switch between their um, spoken languages. And in fact, that is the reason uh, why apparently the Devehi script was invented. It runs from right to left and uh, the, the islands converted to Islam. And so they wanted to be able to quote from the Quran and other religious texts in Arabic. But being South Asians, they did not want um, to have somebody else's script as their, their vernacular script. They wanted their own script. So they invented a script that runs from right to left. But the idea was that they could code switch in and out uh, between Pana and Arabic script. Thank you very much. And a question by Dan Habo. Hi, um, fascinating. I'm, I'm convinced. I think you probably want to add also N1, initial numeracy. I, mean, I I speak a few languages. The only one I can do mental arithmetic in is English. I mean, German yes. kind of, but very painful. Yeah, um, I know the I know the. And a quick thing for your collection: there's a Japanese milk product, and I can't remember the name. Hopefully, there are some Japanese speakers here who can, which is written in katakana and looks imitates the English word for milk. Oh, um, so the that's question a great example. was. I think, so the um, language I've done the most field work on is a Native American one called Kiowa. And um, getting Kiowa speakers uh, now all fluent in English, and they find it extremely difficult to take the, Ki the, the um, English alphabet, let's call it, and use it to write Kiowa. And it's obvious there are mismatching sounds. But the impression that I get is that it's not just they don't want to say new letters. They don't want new digraphs. They don't want new orthographic rules. Right. So I'm wondering what the correct level of granularity is. Is so I didn't absorb the <laughs> script and writing system and so on. So is script yeah. the the right level of granularity, or is there a, is there also an orthographic rule? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> that that was the that was the slide I skipped over. Um, yes, there is this strong um, effect of the orthography as well, um, but I would say that it, it builds. So the difference between um, different orthographies that use basically the same script is sort of like dialectal differences within a language. They may be annoying and problematic, but they're nowhere near at the level of between one language and another. And so um, it, the differences operate at the level of the individual orthographic rules, but they're much, much bigger when you actually swap in uh, different symbols that might stand for different uh, size units and so forth. So um, it operates all across that spectrum, but it's most visible when you actually switch scripts. Okay, and a uh, remark by Cornelia. Well, Janice, my remarks in the chat already. Uh, the one remark was about uh, Chinese children learning um, their transcription of in, in Roman letters of their own language first in school during the first six weeks before they start off uh, learning characters. Uh, they do retain the letters, it seems, because later they easily learn to write the foreign language English, but they forget how to read and write their um, native language uh, using Roman letters. Um, and this, they don't even recognize that what is written in front of them may be their native tongue because it's written in the wrong script. And my other remark was about numeracy. That is re research into the uh, performance by interpreters who have to interpret numbers indicates that um, 
evidently numbers are processed somewhere else in the brain in the language which makes it hard to process numbers uh, in the foreign language much less and, and even more so in the foreign script and that's just i wanted to add these two indeed um i'm glad i don't have to translate from um classical mayan because you know they had a uh, vigesimal system and there'd be no way i could do that on the fly uh, so yes point well taken um the uh the use of pinyin in um, Chinese schools, I, I have some um, sort of secondhand experience with that because my daughter taught English in, in China. And her experience was that, um, at least in rural China, in, among the sort of less well educated people there, the pinyin was never really something that they understood all that well. Uh, and that alphabetic writing in general was a very foreign concept to them. Uh, and even if they might um, not start formal instruction in characters initially, they are still surrounded by a culture that uses characters. And so just as I was saying that children do learn certain aspects of their script implicitly, they're surrounded by a culture that operates in characters and they're learning uh, some of that learning just happens uh, even before they start school. Okay, thank you very much, Amalia, for this fascinating talk.